Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jody Kilbasa. I'm the Vice Provost for the Arts and the Director of the Virginia Film Festival at the University of Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Transforming the Arts in Charlottesville. Uh, I'm joined by Alice Rauscher, University Architect. Alice directs the architecture, planning, and landscape design of the University of Virginia's grounds. And Ben Rouse, Music Director of the Charlottesville Symphony at the University of Virginia. Uh, I'd like to start out first of all by thanking Tessa Ader for her remarkable gift that will help us transform the arts both at the University of Virginia and here in Charlottesville. It was a gift in September of $50 million towards building a new performing arts center. Uh, we could not be more grateful, more and more excited about this extraordinary gift. Uh, I would also like to take a moment to thank the Joseph and Robert Cornell Memorial Foundation for their extraordinary support for the arts uh, in the entire community of Charlottesville, both with numerous nonprofits in the arts um, throughout Charlottesville and of course here at at the University of Virginia. Uh, Joe Erdman and Melissa Young's support for the arts has really, really helped us move the arts to a new level. And we are tremendously grateful for their continued support as well. So um, I'd like to get started and I'd like to introduce Alice Rauscher, who's going to be taking us through a presentation. Uh, Alice, if you would. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to join you today to share some background on our um, current uh, thinking on the on the uh, and Ivy Carter, our current planning and design for the landscape and buildings. But first, I just need to take a few minutes to acknowledge the multitude of dedicated colleagues and collaborators in the offices of the president, the provost, the chief operating officer, facilities management, the University of Virginia Foundation, and the Office of the Architect for the University, in addition to our talented consultants, whom I would just like to quickly name. They include Dumont Jenks, Biohabitats, Oma Van Sweden, VHB, Hopkins Architects with VMDO for the School of Data Science, Deborah Burke uh, Partners with Hanbury for the UVA Hotel and Conference Center, and Howler and Yoon with Hanbury for the Karsh Institute of Democracy. You will uh, see that it clearly takes a village to build a new district. So with that, let me get started. Uh, so no doubt you've heard a lot about the Emmett Ivy Corridor, a 14 and a half acre parcel at the intersection of Emmett Street and Ivy Road over the last few years or so. In fact, under President Ryan's top priorities for 2022, after protecting and promoting the health and safety of the community, which understandably is number one, Number two is advocating the key initiatives of the Emmett Ivy Corridor, notably the landscape, the School of Data Science, the Hotel and Conference Center, the Institute of Democracy, and wait for it, the Performing Arts Center. Uh, and, and why is that? Well, when we began actively planning this parcel over six years ago, there were those of it, those of those, sorry, out there who thought of it as the opportunity to provide an entry or a gateway to the university. While the intersection is indeed important, we saw this parcel more as, the ha as having the ability to provide connectivity between central and north grounds, as you can see on this slide. While the rotunda and the lawn will always be the heart and soul of the university, this parcel is in the geographic center of most of the academic activity on grounds, as you can see. But the parcel was somewhat inaccessible with the railroad tracks, lack of sidewalks, and lots of surface parking and curb cuts, making it really inhospitable to pedestrians and bicyclists. So on this diagram, the blue lines represent pedestrian travel, the orange existing bike lanes, with the circles identifying key intersections. So you can see that the Emmett Ivy parcel, along with the athletics area, which is just north of the railroad tracks, is really what we consider the hole in the donut when it comes to connectivity uh, within this community. In the design of the Ivy Corridor Framework Plan, we proposed uh, a, national, a rational network of streets, pathways, and bridges that would help to bring about the desired connectivity. And you can clearly see now weaving this area into the larger surrounding context. The plan proposed developing a better quality of the public realm, you know, the public streets and sidewalks, 
so that an inhospitable pedestrian environment with narrow sidewalks, utility poles that one has to navigate around, and steep concrete retaining walls that some of us regularly uh, scrape our elbows on, um, as shown in this section, might become a much safer intersection with wider tree-lined sidewalks and landscape terracing with a pedestrian stair up to our International Residential College, as shown on the right. It's really meant to be a, a, a traffic calming intersection, if you will, with a much more pedestrian and bicycle activity. So that instead of this experience, one used to encounter along Emmett Street entering Charlottesville and the university grounds. Can you remember what an imposing presence the Cavalier in once was? We proposed that this would be the experience with dedicated bike lanes, planted tree lawns, and a wide multi-use path developed in collaboration with the city of Charlottesville and their streetscape improvement project. So this was the Emmett, this was the Emmett Ivy site when we began the study just six short years ago. We knew that there were at least two amenities on the site, at least, at least we thought of them as amenities. Uh, the daylighted stream that was constructed during an earlier stormwater and stream management project that resulted in the beautiful dell just south on Emmett Street and the existing parking garage, meaning that at least in the short term that we would not need to build any additional parking to support this new development on this parcel. The landscape framework plan that was developed in 2016 proposed relocating the daylighted stream to the center of the site, enabling city block size parcels to face both the street and the interior green and screen the existing parking garage. This linear green will be a working landscape collecting stormwater for the district with a corner pond as shown in the slide on the lower right, providing much needed stormwater storage to prevent the future flooding of Emmett Street. The design process involved a fair amount of benchmarking analysis to understand and communicate the scale and proportion of the open space proposed on the Emmett Ivy corridor. The linear green and the corner will total approximately 4.8 acres, not unlike you know what, uh, but while the lawn, because of its elevation, is a landscape that is high and dry, we know that the Emmett Ivy corridor, also because of its uh, ground elevation, is low and wet. The design of the green uh, continues our tradition of imagining our landscapes as great civic social spaces with integrated landscapes, buildings and program linked by views and activity. And since this landscape is so central to the identity of the district, great effort has gone into making sure that it will look beautiful in all seasons. The team has designed a really robust planting palette with specific focus on seasonal plantings for late spring to make sure we will have beautiful color for graduation, a palette for late summer when the students will be returning to grounds, late fall for the holidays, and it will even look beautiful during the occasional, actually <laughs> more frequent Charlottesville snows. So um, the program for what gets built on the site has been equally well considered. When President Ryan arrived, he formed the Emmett Ivy Task Force, which looked at programmatic needs for the site and proposed overarching goals uh, of activity and inclusivity. The task force also proposed three nexuses of creativity and experimental arts, democracy and discovery as shown by the pink, orange and blue blocks on this diagram. The yellow is meant to identify all the shared public space on the site, not only in the open green, but also within each building, meaning that no one building is meant to be uh, owned by any one particular program. The site on the southwest side of the garage, it, garage is shown as all yellow, identifying the site for the University Hotel and Conference Center, which is a program that will serve the broader university and surrounding communities. And so the first three sites that we are currently developing 
are on the corner green for the new School of Data Science, the site towards the center for the new UVA Hotel and Conference Center, and the site at the end of the axis of the linear green for the Institute of Democracy. Last year, as you may be aware, as Jenny mentioned, we received a generous gift in support of a new performing arts center, which we propose to be located on the most prominent corner of the site at Emmett Street. This lead gift from Tessa Adder will truly transform the arts at UVA by providing a state-of-the-art home for concerts, dance, theater, and interdisciplinary art forms. As President Ryan stated, the Performing Arts Center will be a place that celebrates the arts as fundamental to the human condition, a university education, and a democratic society. We also uh, have submitted a request uh, for funding to the state, which looks likely to be approved. That is, if an overall budget gets approved at the state. So if all falls into place, we could have a Center for the Arts at UVA up and running within the next five years or so. It's truly remarkable after dreaming about it for decades. But also, as Jenny mentioned, we were incredibly fortunate to receive a grant in 2018 from the Cornell Foundation that first supported this vision by enabling a detailed feasibility and programming study for a performing arts center that set the ideal size for the facility at 1,200 seats. And showed us that we could fill the hall with existing performing programs alone not to mention all the incredible traveling shows that this will enable us to host. This tally doesn't yet take into consideration all the other non-performance events, such as seminars or graduations, which could also support the mission of the university. I know Jody will go into more detail about this uh, in a few minutes. So our effort in the design of the overall district has been to reinforce the tenets of the Emmett Ivy Task Force by locating public facing program and activity within the buildings, as you can see in this X-ray view, along the important exterior civic spaces of the stepped amphitheater around the pond, the green and the pedestrian promenades. No. Alice, if I may, I just wanted to, to mention and add in, and this is actually a, a perfect slide to talk about this. Um, if you are a returning alumni to the University of Virginia, uh, this puts you right next to the Performing Arts Center and what we eventually hope will be relocation of the museums. Um, it puts you, if you choose to stay at the hotel, a, a quick walk to John Paul Jones Arena or to the baseball stadium or even less than a 15 minute walk over to Scott Stadium as well, and approximately 10 minutes to the Rotunda. As we have incoming students that are considering the University of Virginia, and we want to be able to attract the best and brightest students, more than likely they will come to tour the university and stay in this hotel as well. And one of their very first uh, exposures will be to the Performing Arts Center and this beautiful entry into the grounds before they tour the historic grounds as well. And as we continue to work to attract top faculty, um, uh, staff, and again, students at the University of Virginia, positioning this Performing Arts Center in a welcoming and inclusive way is really, really important because so many of these students either come from underserved areas and they do not have this type of facility in their communities, or they might come from an area that does, a larger market as well. The same thing for our faculty as well. And very often, although we live in a stunning area, um, having these kind of amenities to attract the very best and the very brightest to our community is important. And I might say trickles down to all the facets of Charlottesville as well as we want to attract other people to join us here in our beautiful city and our beautiful environment as well. So this location is going to create a creative nexus. It's going to be a wonderful, welcoming, inclusive area. And I might say that the, the retention pond, the water feature, and this green space up the middle uh, really opens it up to the broader community as well, which I think is a very significant and important feature of this. So thank you for hearing me out on that, Alice. Well said, Jody. Absolutely right. Um, and as Jody mentioned, you know, the, our future vision um, for this uh, for this full build out is active and inclusive, a district where the interior and exterior spaces are fully engaged with each other. 
So um, just to give you an update, so far we've broken ground uh, for the School of Data Science, which you see in the foreground. We expect to break ground this summer on the Hotel and Conference Center, and we are in design for the Karsh Institute of Democracy, which we expect to occupy in 2026. I can't wait to give you an update in uh, a, a couple of years on the progress we're making on the Performing Arts Center. So you'll notice that there is a similar uh, material palette uh, in this district to that of Central Grounds, and that is, of course, intentional. While this district allows us a little more freedom in terms of the architectural language, we want this to feel a part of Grounds, and we are being, being very deliberate with the scale and material choices for this district. So if you'll allow me, I'll take you on a little tour of the projects to date. Uh, the School of Data Science will provide a civic scaled entry to this new district, allowing for exterior gatherings at its entry plaza and providing a great backdrop for activity at the amphitheater around the pond. You can also see one of what we refer to as uh, one of the landscape porches in the landscape on the right of this slide which will be a great gathering place off the plaza in front of the Performing Arts Center. The architects for the School of Data Science have made a great effort to design an interior landscape of the building connected to the exterior. So you can see from this section how the cascading stair beginning in the lobby uh, next to the hub and moving through the building to the fourth floor roof terrace allows views through the building uh, uh, through the interior of the building and out to the surrounding landscape. And the roof terrace uh, at the fourth floor along the east facade will provide great views overlooking the pond to the Performing Arts Center, as well as fantastic views back towards the rotunda and the new addition to Albany Library. Uh, while the first floor hub with its double height space right on the corner of the building will host lectures and other events allowing the life and activity of the School of Data Science to be on full display to the district and welcome in the broader community. Imagine if there were communicating programs between the Performing Arts Center, the hotel, the Institute of Democracy and the School of Data Science. All these public facing spaces could participate in that. So continuing from the School of Data Science along the pedestrian promenade, this is a view of the entry to the hotel at the cafe level and the restaurant's outdoor terraces above the cafe looking west. This entry will provide uh, direct access to the university's welcome center and will be visible from the entry to the parking garage. The, the point of the welcome center as opposed to a visitors alone center is that uh, one could uh, get tickets to the Performing Arts Center from this location. One could find out what was going on in the entire district from this location. We're designing the ground floor of the hotel to be as transparent as possible, uh, encouraging a great deal of pedestrian engagement. This view is looking west along the promenade, just a little further uh, west than the previous view, which will con connect the future performing arts center with views into what we are calling the hotel's living room up to the hotel's main entry. At the end of the linear green towards the center of the site is the site for the Institute of Democracy. So this image shows the main hotel arrival from Ivy Road with its port cocher protecting cars and pedestrians from the weather. Uh, the hotel will have 214 guest rooms and approximately 28,000 square feet of conference facilities, making it, uh, I believe, the largest in the region with the capacity to host conferences for 500 people. So we're very excited about what this building will bring to the corridor, not to mention the excitement we have over the rooftop bar you can see just above the entry. The views from which will be spectacular as shown in the upper two renderings. Imagine getting a pre or post concert drink in this space, uh, looking out over the, um, over the views. And the lower two renderings are of the living room, the cafe, and the grab and go at the ground level, proposing open, transparent, accessible gathering space connected to the exterior landscape.
The hotel's entry plaza will connect to the Karsh Institute of Democracy, shown just to the left in this rendering. And though we've just started on the design phase for this project, the views from the proposed site are fitting for a program of this stature. Again, in this sketch on the right, you can see how prominent a performing arts center will, uh, will be from this vantage point. Uh, and so as we continue to plan future exciting activities on the site, we're currently grounded, very grounded in the reality of constructing the public realm of streets and sidewalks, the necessary but unglamorous utility and enabling work, beginning the foundational work of the School of Data Science and breaking ground on the hotel and conference center. So that we are all the while optimistic about the realization of the vision of the arts, discovery and research and democracy, all having a home on the Emmett Ivy corridor. So thanks so much. And I will now turn the screen over to Jody. Thank you, Alice. Um, I must say, I'm sure Alice will agree with me that uh, none of us thought that we would be this far along on the Emmett Ivy corridor uh, just four short years ago. It's really, really extraordinary to see uh, how much has already been accomplished and uh, how fortunate we are to have received this gift from Tessa Ader. So thank you uh, for that as well. Um, this Center for the Arts really has an opportunity to, to transform, I think, the arts not only here in Charlottesville, but of course at the University of Virginia. We do not have a facility like this currently in Charlottesville. Of course, we have the extraordinary Paramount Theater for which we're grateful and we will continue to uh, present programming there. Certainly, I know uh, as the director of the film festival, we're going to continue to do that in the future there. But this is a really unique opportunity to build a performing arts center from the grounds up, from the ground up, grounds up, uh, uh, designed specifically, acoustically, um, uh, in an audience friendly manner, and will become a facility that we do not have in this area of central Virginia. Uh, first and foremost, it will exist to expand and opportunities for our students to pursue their creativity and, of course, our creative faculty as well um, through the faculty-led performance groups that we have, such as the Charlottesville Symphony at the University of Virginia or the University Singers or countless others that we have. And then I think positioned where this is, it really is going to be a beacon, uh, a creative nexus, if you will, um, uh, to bring the arts and our creative faculty and students together and the broader community, because we hope that this will provide a platform for a number of nonprofit groups in the community, like the Charlottesville Op Opera, like the Charlottesville Ballet, and others as well. So it will not just exclusively be used for university programming. Of course, one of the things we hope to do is create a lively arts series as well, where we can bring in internationally renowned groups. Uh, um, of course, this will be extraordinary for our students. Uh, they will be able to offer master classes within the site as well. Uh, so again, this particular positioning uh, and the design of the entire Emmett Ivy site is designed to be welcoming, inclusive. I can envision students throwing a Frisbee out there, having a picnic, working on their laptops, and community members walking their dogs or biking through this. Uh, and of course, attending the Center for the Arts, the new Performing Arts Center as well. So on so many different levels, I feel that this is important. And I think the university has been striving to make sure that that sometimes traditional town gown barrier does not exist with the way this site is designed. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So the Center for the Arts, stage one, a performing arts center. Um, this again, as I mentioned, would be a hybrid academic phase and community facing building. It would be able to serve as a, a, a platform for community groups, but also as Alice shared in her slide earlier, we've already identified at least 250 
50 evenings a year that we could currently program with what we're doing elsewhere on grounds. So again, there is a real need for our students and faculty for this Performing Arts Center. But I might add, it's really, really important to power the growth of the arts writ large in our broader community to serve as a platform for a number of our community groups. Again, part of this broader vision is the UVA museums. Uh, we have two incredible museums in the Freyland Museum of Art and the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection. Um, uh, unfortunately, neither one is large enough to be able to present more than 1% of their collection at any given time. And so we're seeking a lead gift to be able to fund their move over right next to the Performing Arts Center. And again, what do we think that would do? Well, that would create real destination um, uh, for people throughout Central Virginia, for the community. I might add that currently right now, the Fralin Museum of Art services over 6,000 K through 12 students each year and have been asked to expand that. And they currently do not have the room to be able to do that. Uh, from where I'm, I'm broadcasting right now, I see the yellow school buses that line up day after day to bring the kids into the museum. And it's an extraordinary program that they bring presenting for over 30 years here in Charlottesville, and they just don't have the space to do it anymore with the number of students that they have. Uh, again, the mu museums would distinguish, the location of the museums would distinguish the University of Virginia as well, and so important for this region of Central Virginia because you have to travel all the way to the Taubman Museum in Roanoke or to the Reg Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond to attend a similar art museum. And of course, the Kluge Roo is in a colonial style building on Pantops. Um, it is over four miles for students and for faculty. Uh, and the building itself is not adequate facility for the storage of what is one of the most important collections of Aboriginal arts outside of Australia in the world. So again, co-locating these under one roof would create a, a vibrant, dynamic, creative hub. And imagine our vision for this. And if you could go to the next slide, Alice is to create a facility that's running from 8 a.m. in the morning until midnight, not just five nights a week for a seven o'clock or an eight o'clock performance. Um, but we are creating rehearsal and performance spaces within this performing arts center uh, that we take care of the currently deficient front and back house facilities. Um, and again, even at the Paramount Theater, right now, which again is a stunning movie palace, but it was a movie palace built in 1931 that was never designed to be a performing arts center. So as a result of that, even old Cabell Hall on the grounds of the university, again, was not designed as a performing arts center. What we need is that state of the art performing arts center acoustically designed with front and back of house facilities that can adequately or beyond adequately be able to present the works that we're doing here at UVA and more broadly in the community as well. I might add that uh, parking is always a problem uh, at the university and even within Charlottesville itself. So as Alice mentioned earlier, the location of the Performing Arts Center immediately adjacent to the parking garage is going to make that far easier uh, than any of the current circumstances. Uh, uh, if you are currently attending the symphony at Old Cabell Hall, you have to park in central parking grounds, navigate several flights of steps or take an elevator up and then more flights of steps and then walk across the lawn over to Old Cabell. So it's not ideal for a lot of our patrons who have mobility issues as well. Next slide, if you would. So again, we feel that the University of Virginia is long over to do to have the state of the art space. Um, we're excited about these opportunities to connect more broadly to the community, but also to provide the platforms, the rehearsal spaces, and the performance spaces for our students and faculty that we believe they so richly deserve and need. Um, and particularly to have these additional rehearsal spaces and classroom spaces as well. Again, in the past when we brought in international groups like the Martha Graham Dance Company um, or other dance companies or performers in music and theater, um, uh, teaching the master class has been an issue because of our rehearsal space. So again, having this essentially laboratory for art and creative nexus is really vital for us moving forward. Next slide.
And so I just wanted to close that this is something that I can't say enough about. I think that this will have just such a lasting impact in our community. Uh, again, it, it's my hope that this is something that will um, offer bridge into the broader community for people to come onto the grounds of the university and enjoy the work that our students and faculty are doing. Again, can highlight the work of another a number of performing groups um, in the community itself that are not directly affiliated with the university and also bring in internationally renowned um, actors and performers, musicians, dance groups, um, uh, and artists as well. And so with that, I want to bring on Ben Rouse, who is the music director of the Charlottesville Symphony, just to talk a little bit about the needs of the symphony and how that translates. Thank you, Jody. And um, I'm thrilled to be together uh, with all of our attendees um, for this opportunity to talk about this really remarkable uh, project, thanks to the vision of Tessa Ader. I want to begin by talking about my own um, evolution in my thinking about music. Uh, some years ago, I thought of music um, in terms of, well, in terms of its style, in terms of it, how it appealed to me, in terms of how it hit my ear. And if I liked a piece, I probably liked it because I was attracted to its surface. I was attracted to the um, language of the composer, the style that it was written in, the way that it captured my imagination. And my thinking about the value of music has shifted very significantly recently. I, I, this all came to mind because my father, it happens, is an architect. And when I had the chance to uh, uh, join on this panel with the university architect, I was pretty thrilled. And I wanted to bring up something that Alice said in an interview, Architecture Daily, she said that the real impact of a building is broad and far reaching and complex and is not anything to do with its style when she said that style is superficial and the true impact of a building is much more complex than that and involves a lot of different factors. I took that very seriously because my own thinking about music now is I'm not so interested in the style a piece is written in anymore. I've become interested in what does a piece do? Whose voice is it amplifying? What is it saying? What is it teaching us about our world? What is it reminding us about our everyday lives or about current events as many pieces are quite relevant to current events? And I've been exploring that side of music uh, much more actively recently. There are those who will remember the uh, piece that the Charlottesville Symphony performed by Karim Rostam. Uh, Karim Rostam's writing about uh, his own personal reflections on the Syrian civil war. This type of thing that a piece really does, that is not about the style that it's in, which is relatively superficial, but what a piece does to make us think, to make us feel, to make us more complete as people. I've been really quite interested in the impact in our lives, in the outside of music, that music specifically can have. So as I think about a performing arts center, I'm really interested in this idea of what can the building do, not just how does it look or what style is it in, but what will it do? for us, because I think that's where the real impact lies. And so I wanted to mention that because I thank Alice for the insight and the way that it informed me about my own thinking about music was very interesting. So what could such a building do for Charlottesville, for the university, and for the symphony? Well, first of all, as uh, Jody and Alice were both mentioning, I think it's supremely important that this facility can be welcoming to all, that it can be open, that it can be, first of all, visible 
from a car, you know where it is. If you just drive around Charlottesville, you've never seen Old Cabell Hall. It's, it's on the map. It's a place that people can identify. And yes, it's a place that people can park. And it's personally quite important to me that it's accessible to people easily from their transportation. That That's already a radical change from what we have at Old Cabell Hall, which is special, but is truly only open to a subset of the population because of where it is. In terms of the making of art, this would be a fully versatile space that as much as I personally love Old Cabell Hall, it is not a, for a fully versatile space. It will allow the symphony to collaborate with any number of groups that right now we cannot really collaborate with. When I first came to town, I was really excited to learn Charlottesville has its own ballet company. And I immediately asked, where can we perform together? I love accompanying ballet. It's a personal passion of mine. It's, it's, the, it's one of the highest things a symphony can do. And the answer to that question was, unfortunately, basically nowhere. This would be the only place that we can have a proper collaboration with a ballet company, with an opera production, with a visiting ballet company. There's lots of energy behind Charlottesville Ballet right now, which I'm thrilled about. And I am also in a conversation with a choreographer who is a former member of Dance Theater of Harlem. And I said, well, could you come and bring a company to Charlottesville, but keep it small because we can only afford you about seven feet at the lip of the stage because we don't have a place to collaborate. With a place like this, I could proudly say, bring your company, bring everyone. We're going to put on an amazing show. And in a conversation I just had with Michael Slan about possibilities for collaborating with the university singers, this issue came up again. The symphony and the university singers do enjoy a very fruitful collaboration, but we are again extremely limited by the shape and the sheer size of our facilities. And so when, for example, Michael Slan and I both agreed that the Virginia composer Adolphus Hale Storks new requiem type work that is a reaction to George Floyd's death would be an excellent work for this university and for our groups to perform. We then had to look at the score and say, we don't think it's going to fit. We don't have the facility for that. It uses a big orchestra, it uses a big choir, and it uses soloists, and we're not going to be able to fit. So there are really a broad array of opportunities that we that we cannot realize now with the facilities we have right now. It would transform the possibilities for the Charlottesville Symphony and for the arts at UVA in general. Uh, such a facility would allow me to invite a guest artist without first apologizing that there won't be a dressing room for them. You might not be aware that it, backstage at concert halls, there are places where people can not really complicated stuff, change into their tuxedo or their gown, <laughs> warm up in a place that's comfortable, things that we can't allow at, at Old Cabell Hall. The backstage would make the concert experience radically different in terms of who we can invite, in terms of not delaying the start of every concert or having every intermission bleed long because the lobby is not truly designed for the type of performances that we are trying to cram into Old Cabell Hall. And it would also allow me to grow the Charlottesville Symphony in a way that I can't right now. It would make the arts at UVA and music at UVA an obvious and visible destination so that I could proudly say the symphony plays in the new performing arts center and I could tell the story of performance at the University of Virginia. UVA has a world class music faculty and our facilities do not represent it. And so we can't truly reflect who we are at UVA. My own life uh my own life in school when i was studying conducting at university of michigan and for a year before that at university of connecticut was shaped by two fantastic performing arts facilities there hill auditorium in ann arbor and the jorgensen center 
in Storrs, Connecticut, a, a tiny town in the middle of farmland in the middle of Connecticut. Yes, there are farms in Connecticut, but with a destination concert hall. And without that, I never would have heard the Leningrad Philharmonic, the Kirov Philharmonic, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. These, these experiences would have been completely lost to me. This art center at the University of Virginia will transform the experience of my students, our students, and everyone who lives in Charlottesville. And uh, with that, I think I want to uh, pass it back to Jody um, to bring us to the next phase. Thank you, Ben. Great, great job on explaining that. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> your input on that. Um, and Alice, thank you as well. I, I just want to finish before we open up to questions by saying um, that there is a broad vision for Emmett Ivy, which would include a relocation of the museums and we would seek a, a, a lead gift of another $50 million to make that happen. And recently discussion has also turned to the possibility and I say that possibility of relocating the music program over there, because again, part of what we're hoping for is to be able to create this nexus in which 24 seven, there are students and faculty um, creating art, experiencing art, and that the community is coming down to participate in that either by consuming it um, uh, as patrons or by participating in it, in it directly um, with some of our community groups out there, as Ben mentioned, um, Charlottesville Opera and the Charlottesville Ballet as well, among others, because there's a long list of those. So um, we feel it's an extraordinary moment and we're in extraordinary crossroads here. Um, um, what this gift has allowed us to do is um, uh, to think in larger terms, to realize a 1,200-seat performing arts hall with a 150-seat recital hall and an experimental art space as well, and studio space for dance and for musicians as well, and we hope to go even bigger than that. So at this point, um, Cameron, I'd like to throw it to you. This is Cameron Moat, our Director of Development for University Arts, um, who's going to be taking questions. And Alice and Ben and I will do our very best to accommodate. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, panel. Um, we've had a number of questions. And the first one was actually about the music department moving. And the question, Ben, I think is for you is, what would this mean for the music department to be on site next to the, or around the Performing Arts Center? Right, we haven't talked much about the rest of the music department yet. Um, the music department is uh, interestingly situated on right at the foot of the lawn, physically a great location, uh, facility wise, not at all sufficient for what the music department needs. So many of our faculty don't have offices on grounds at all. Many of those who do have offices have them in different buildings. And we are constantly short on space, proper space for rehearsal, proper space for performances, proper space for guest appearances. Um, there is one line of questioning here about what happens to old Cabell Hall in the face of a new performing arts center. To my way of thinking, the old Cabell could still, and I I anticipate will still be an integral part of of music department operations and such a uh, such a building would make old Cabell more accessible to students right now there's a terrible scheduling bottleneck in old Cabell Hall that we're just going through right now this time of year for the following year and old Cabell would become more accessible for for student use than it currently is if if uh, and when the performing arts center uh, goes up. So that's one angle to this is that I believe Old Cabell will still be crowded and will still be vibrant and and the student experience of performing spaces will be improved by that, especially through accessibility to Old Cabell Hall. Point number one. Point number two, the idea of music of moving the entire music department to Emmett Ivy is, well, it's an incredibly exciting one because it would house our incredibly well, prominent and incredible diverse faculty in this new face of the university. Not everyone realizes what we have in the music department. 
a bluegrass ensemble, a professor of hip hop, an African drumming and dance ensemble. It's the most kind of multifarious department that I've ever encountered. And then all of that is on top of acoustic composition and electronic composition and the various fields of scholarship and intellectual play that happen in the music department. It um, So yes, in, in terms of uh, uh, the rest of the department, uh, a move which is not yet concrete, this is this is still a hypothetical move that we're talking about to Emmett Ivey, would be extremely transformational and I believe would be ideal simply in terms of logistics, it would be uh, tricky to have department operations split from Emmett Ivey to uh, Central Grounds if uh, the music department stays in Old Cabell but starts making heavy use of the Performing Arts Center, then, then we've got a new kind of set of issues. I'll, I'll just uh, add a uh, collateral benefit would be the possibility of renovating Old Cabell Hall um, <laughs> the dire need of you know a, a major renovation um, just for basic things. I mean, the building is, is old and well-loved, but um, you can see the transformation in the rotunda um, before and after um, its major renovation. And this moving the music department would just um, facilitate that sort of rebirth of the building. Um, so a little collateral benefit. Alice, while we have your have you, um, so why are you putting a performing arts center next to a what railway line? <laughs> Did you make that up, Cameron? <laughs> no, it came through. Well, well, I have to say this is the most, you know, the most prominent site um, you know, on this uh, on this corridor. Um, it is it is visible on the, both the um, entry route of uh, on Ivy Road and and Emmett Street. It's going to be a beacon for the university and the community. Um, so I wouldn't say we're putting it on the railroad tracks. I would say that um, you know Charlottesville has two railroad lines that cross all the way through it, and this is uh, a prominent site in the in Charlottesville and at the university that happens to be adjacent to a railroad um, line. Um, I, I also like to point out that uh, in a previous life, I worked on the renovation of Carnegie Hall, which is built over the 7th Avenue subway. So we have the science and technology to acoustically isolate uh, the performance hall from the vibrations of the rail line. And we've considered that in uh, developing the budget for, for the building. So, um, you know, is it, is it absolutely ideal and in a field, you know, where you have no outside influences? No, but uh, the benefits of this site far outweigh the inconvenience of, of the rail line adjacent to it. Thank you. Jody, we've had some questions about Culbreth Theatre and um, the relationship it will be with the new Performing Arts Centre. Right. Well, I think, first of all, um, over in the music and I'm sorry, over in the drama and dance department, really, um, it is dance that that needs a new facility with a sprung dance floor and, and rehearsal space. And so I, I do believe that we're going to have a strong commitment to doing that in the new Performing Arts Center. Drama, on the other hand, has three incredibly great theaters over in Culberth Building. They have the extraordinary Kaplan Theater, which is a relatively new. I think it's about seven years old, uh, incredible thrust theater. Um, the lobby was renovated then and uh Cobra theater itself which is a proscenium arch theater uh was renovated at that time and they also have a small black box theater which is really flexible it can be 100 seats it can be up to 200 seats to, depending on how it's configured um and th that tends to skew more towards experimental um theater in in that that theater as well so they really have some very good facilities and so the performing arts center wasn't necessarily is not going to be necessarily designed to house normal drama productions. There is the possibility that um, uh, the the new the old Heritage Theater, just renamed the Virginia Theater Festival, could potentially use um, the Performing Arts Center in the future. But I don't see it being used by drama on a day to day basis. However, I do see dance over there um, uh, and it having studio space. Uh, now, of course. We bring in a theatrical production there'll be an opportunity for master classes for the students and it would be my hope that that would take place in the performing arts center and the studio space and teaching the space that we've designed there thanks jody 
Um, so this one I think is for me. It talks about um, a lead gift for the museum and it says, can you talk further about opportunities for philanthropic support? Are there, is there, uh, any, are there any naming support uh, opportunities for support of a million dollars and above? So what we're talking through at the moment is uh, we are accepting gifts for the Performing Arts Centre, but we are lining up gifts for the museum in anticipation for the $50 million gift. So if people wish to talk about that, we can explore what the naming opportunities are, for the, especially for, for the Performing Arts Centre, but also as we go forward with the, um, uh, with the museum, hopefully we'll secure that gift in um, quite soon. So that, that is our plan, but if people wish to speak to me, they can um, um, follow up. I'll send out an email following this uh, with uh, all the contact email addresses so people can get in contact with me. Alice, I've got one for you about the, um, the daylighting of the Dell. Um, and it says, oh, let me find it. I think I read it, Cameron. Yeah, it, good. It, it, yeah. Uh, the Dell will absolutely remain um, because it's all part of a larger um, hydrological system of stream and stormwater management uh, in this area. So the Dell, this area at Emmett Ivy and the wetlands around uh, JPJ Arena, for instance, are all connected. So. Um, I mean, not only will it remain, but we are, um, some of you may be aware, we're in construction for the Contemplative Commons, um, a really beautiful building that is kind of on the other side of the Dell to really finish um, off that landscape. So it's going to be even more um, beautiful than, than it currently is. But, but the intention at um, Emmett Ivy is to be a very similar space. However, you know, it always frustrated me a little bit that there's no place to really sit, um, you know, around the Dell. And we've been very conscious about uh, developing accessible terraced um, steps, terraced landscape uh, around the, as an amphitheater around the pond from which you'll be able to look perhaps at an exterior performance uh, at the Performing Arts Center. I mean, it's really meant to be this really great civic space. So. Um, if one could consider improving on the Dell, I think we've learned, um, you know, some lessons, but absolutely the Dell will be even, even uh, more improved. Um, so Alice, assuming the money does come through from the Commonwealth in this budget, which we're very confident about, um, and uh, the university moves forward with the project, what is the time frame for you, do you think, for having an architect or having some design? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I think as soon as we know that, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the budget is moving forward, we will issue an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. We use a two-step process here to, because um, uh, as you can imagine, this is a very desirable project, you know, for Performing Arts Center. I think of all the projects, and we've had quite extraordinary ones in the, in the past couple of years, I've received a lot of interest from a lot of architects about this building um, and acousticians and theater consultants. Um, and so we uh, hope to issue to post the RFQ uh, late spring, early summer. And from there, it's probably a three month process to go through the proposals, um, interview candidates, and then make a selection. Thank you. And Jody, one for you, um, New Performing Arts Centre, will it be able to accommodate national touring companies or major shows? Uh, that, that's the plan entirely. Uh, the idea was the consultants several years back um, uh, in that um, study that was uh, funded by the Cornell Foundation uh, arrived at what they considered to be a sweet spot, which was 1,200 seats uh, that would allow us to bring in touring productions of a certain size. Now, you're, you're not going to see Hamilton in there necessarily because the market size of Charlottesville and the surrounding region doesn't allow for that. That type of show is still likely to go to Richmond or Washington, D.C. Uh, but there are a lot of Broadway bus and truck shows, a lot of touring dance companies um, of incredible renown that we'll be able to bring in and, and highlight here and present to the broader community in Charlottesville and, of course, to our students and faculty. Can I uh, interject and just tie this back to the previous question, why this site uh, against the railroad tracks is so great is that because of all the um, shows that we hope to bring in, we need a fly. And, you know, a fly is not an easy thing to accommodate, you know, just anywhere. And the railroad track actually provides a great backdrop 
for us to have a fly that's not imposing uh, to the neighborhood. Um, I think that is all of our questions that we have. Uh, ah, here's one, Jody. Here's, uh, will the performance halls be flexible for productions attracting fewer than 1,200, maybe 150? So, you, you know, we're, as Alice mentioned, we don't have the, the designers, the architects in place yet, but I know that one of the things that I would hope we would be able to explore is to be able to design a hall um, that has some form of hard curtain that can become smaller, um, that can accommodate maybe 600 people, uh, because you want to be able to right size performances as well. Um, and so that would be a benefit if we're able to um, uh, accomplish that in the design that would be very, very helpful to have. Um, I, you know, I know <laughs> having produced a lot of shows myself, I'm constantly worried that um, uh, we have the audience there for the production that we're putting on and you die a little death for the artists when they don't have a full house or close to a full house. Um, and we want this entire space to be very flexible, to meet a lot of demands and needs as well. So I, I can't answer that completely yet, but it was my hope that we are able to design a, a space that is incredibly flexible and uh, take care of a lot of different needs. Very quickly, the last question that came in, a fly refers to a fly space, which is the, if you've ever been backstage, you might have seen a series of ropes along the backstage of a theater and that uh, lifts backdrops and set pieces in and out. And if you look carefully at big performing arts centers, you'll see that there's a gigantic thing kind of jutting up the back of the outside of the performance space because they have to be three times as tall as you think they have to be in order to have that kind of flexibility for uh, theatrical productions. All right, I think that's all of our questions. Thank you. Thank well, you. thank you, everyone out there. Um, we certainly greatly appreciate your interest and your, your support. And I'd like to thank Alice and Ben as well.